Welcome everyone to our quarterly Ask the Experts series discussion. This is an opportunity for our community to come together to ask questions that they are wondering about, want to learn about, whether you are new to sarcoidosis or you've had sarcoidosis for a number of years, this is a chance for you to ask questions. What's on your mind? What questions do you have? What concerns do you have? What do you want to know more about? What do you want to learn about research, et cetera? So we'll spend today just having a wonderful conversation with our two panelists that are here with us today in order to answer the questions that you have provided. It was really wonderful to see. We had over 170 registrants for this evening's event. Um, and we are seeing more and more folks joining us um, as, the, as the event is, is, is getting underway. Uh, we received lots and lots of questions from you all, so we may not be able to get to each and every one of your questions, uh, but we will do our best. Uh, and because we are trying to cover as many different questions as possible, we may not have your question worded exactly how you worded it, but know that we will be trying to gather the themes um, so that you can get your question answered by the experts that are joining us today. I mean, with that, I'm now going to introduce our wonderful experts that are, have joined us this evening, um, and then we will start the discussion. I want to encourage all of you to use the chat if you have additional questions that you would like to ask. Again, if we don't get to that question today, we may get to that in a future session, so feel free to put your questions into the chat, and we will do our best to respond to those as well. You are muted throughout the entire session and we do not have the raise hand function available. So the only means to communicate with us is through that chat, which is at the bottom of your screen. I'd now like to welcome our two panelists. Uh, Dr. Chetan Shinoy is a cardiologist and an associate professor of medicine in the cardiovascular division at the University of Minnesota Medical School in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He is also an NIH funded clinical researcher his research efforts are focused on clinical applications of cardiac MRI in improving the diagnosis and treatment of patients with heart muscle diseases and cardiomyopathies. One of the cardiomyopathies that he focuses on is cardiac sarcoidosis, and he has contributed papers in leading journals on diagnosis and treatment of cardiac sarcoidosis. Dr. Shinoy is also part of the member hospital of the FSR Global Sarcoidosis Clinic Alliance. We welcome you today. Glad to be here. And I'd also like to welcome our second panelist, Dr. Husafa Sayed. Dr. Sayed is currently the program director for rheumatology at VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University. Dr. Sayed completed her undergraduate education at the University of Maryland in College Park, Maryland. She went on to complete her medical school training um, in internal medicine, res residency, and rheumatology fellowship at the Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. She joined the faculty in 2012 and is currently an assistant professor of medicine. Dr. Syed's clinical and research interests lie in sarcoidosis. She is one of the founders of the Multidisciplinary Sarcoidosis Clinic um, at VCU, the only one of its kind in Virginia. In addition to the disease process and treatment response, she is also interested in health disparities, the effect of sarcoidosis patients. She has been recognized for her excellence in teaching by medical students and fellows and received the Department of Internal Medicine um, at VCU Excellence in Teaching Award in 2016 and the Department of Internal Medicine at VCU Excellence in Clinical Practices in 2020. Dr. Syed is also a member of the FSR Global Sarcoidosis Clinic Alliance, and we welcome you as well. So much, happy to be here. So I'm gonna to start today's discussion with uh, a number of different questions that we saw come in. And again, these were all provided to us beforehand through registration from, from the attendees that um, are, are wishing to join today. So I wanna start thinking about diagnosis. And Dr. Syed, I'll point this to you first. Um, there's a lot of questions around the genetics and heredity of the disease and trying to understand, is this something that you can pass on to your children? Could you say a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So we do know that there is a genetic, um, a genetic predisposition for sarcoidosis. And there are certainly families who are uh, patients who have um, sarcoidosis that seems to run pretty dominantly in their family. Um, you know, it seems to be not the 
uh, probably not the majority, however. So most patients are the only ones in their family who have sarcoidosis and Dr. Shinoy can certainly weigh in. Um, but it seems to be probably five to 6% of patients who um, have sarcoid that seems to run in the family. So although there is that genetic predisposition, thankfully most patients don't pass it on um, to other family members. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Say. Dr. Shinoy, what did you want to add in? Yeah, I just want to add that um, the question that many patients often have is, you know, I have a family member with sarcoidosis, what's my risk of getting it? So that is very hard to decide and explain, mainly because we know sarcoidosis is not one of the Mendelian type of genetic disorders where we know that um, the siblings or the children may have a fixed risk uh, whether it's autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive. And examples of those are like color blindness, hemophilia, sickle cell anemia. So those we can predict the risk uh, that a sibling or a child will inherit the disease. But with sarcoidosis, we simply don't know. We know that it's more common in families. There is clustering. We know that it happens more often in uh, identical twins who share the uh, DNA compared to fraternal twins who only share 50% of the DNA. So that tells us that there is a genetic component, but it's hard to predict uh, an individual's risk. And of course, picking back on that question, the other question that we often get is, what are the other risk factors that people should be aware of in thinking about sarcoidosis? And so Dr. Shinoy, I'll let you be the first to chime in on this. Um, what other risk factors do we know might be associated with sarcoidosis? So the difficulty with sarcoidosis is we don't really know what causes it. And you may have heard this, there are many triggers and things that contribute to sarcoidosis, but we don't really know what causes it. We, we see it more often in African-Americans in the United States and among Caucasians, we tend to see it more often in um, uh, people of Scandinavian origin. So here in Minnesota, we see more than in other states of the United States. So that's one aspect. Uh, there are many other things that have been incriminated in sarcoidosis, environmental factors, infectious factors, but it's hard to say that those are risk factors for any individual person. Dr. Dr. Sayed, is there anything you wanted to add in there? No, I think Dr. Shinoy covered that pretty well to agree that, you know, the thing to understand about sarcoidosis in general, and I think will probably serve the basis for a lot of our answers is sarcoidosis is just not that well studied in general. So it's hard to know a lot of the answers um, for a, probably a lot of the questions that are on the list for today. So a lot of what we do know is based on kind of um, the studies, the very limited studies that we do have available and kind of you know anecdotal um, data that we have from past studies and kind of what physicians have done in the past. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the other questions that's coming up here is trying to understand uh, when they should be concerned about multiple manifestations of sarcoidosis. So a number of individuals have one form of sarcoidosis, but they're trying to understand if their symptoms are pointing to another form of sarcoidosis. Um, so uh, Dr. Sayed, could you say a little bit about what kinds of symptoms people should be letting their doctors know about that might be pointing to additional uh, manifestations being involved? And Dr. Shinoy, I'll ask you to specifically focus on cardiac and, and what people should be aware of there. Yeah, I think that's a really great question because I'm sure as you all know, I'm sure you've read a lot on sarcoidosis, but sarcoid can really affect almost any organ. Um, and so symptom involvement can really be um, anything almost. So you really um, want to have a physician, I think, who's, um, who knows sarcoid well and can really help you kind of tease out what symptoms um, could be uh, sarcoid and what probably is not sarcoid. So I think certainly if you have anything that you're concerned about, you should bring it up. Absolutely. 
um, and then let let your physician help you figure it out. Um, you know, I always say the things you never want to miss are your eyes, your brain, and your heart. Um, so if there's any symptoms there that you're concerned about, um, you should certainly bring those things up. So for eyes, redness, pain, blurry vision, a lot of floaters. Um, you know, for your brain, new headaches, weakness, numbness, tingling. Um, and then, of course, Dr. Shinoi will talk about the heart symptoms that you should look out for. Yeah, so for the heart, um, there are many symptoms. Uh, the difficulty that we deal with is those symptoms often overlap with other organ systems and also other cardiac problems. And so the symptoms often are shortness of breath, which could be from many things, including lung involvement. It could be palpitations, which again could be from a number of things. Um, and some of this could even be side effects of prednisone treatment for the uh, lung sarcoidosis. And um, others may have abnormalities on the EKG that we often do. And sometimes we do an echocardiogram and we may find an abnormality. The, the good news is among people that we screen uh, with advanced imaging, which is a heart MRI or a PET scan, um, and, and we have done uh, such testing in over 500 of uh, patients who have had uh, biopsy proven sarcoidosis somewhere. The good news is we found heart involvement in probably only one in five. So we often suspect it, but uh, most people who have these symptoms and these abnormalities don't have it. But obviously, it's we don't know who that one in five is, and uh, we would need to test them to understand who they are. So I've seen a couple of questions come in about PVCs and whether that's a concern, um, as well as a, a number of questions that uh, were, were submitted before around arrhythmias. Um, could you say a little bit about what, whether those are symptoms and those should be brought up to people's doctors? Yes, absolutely. Again, the difficulty is PVCs are common uh, even in healthy hearts. They are common in all forms of heart disease, including coronary artery disease, the most common form where you have blockages, but they are indeed uh, a common manifestation in cardiac sarcoidosis. So we should definitely know about it. And um, in most cases, we do look for heart involvement with things like a heart MRI. Uh, I got a question and it's a good one. Uh, slipped into medical language there about um, saying what a PVC is. Do you mind articulating yes. that for the community? So a PVC stands for a premature ventricular complex. It just means it's a heartbeat that comes earlier than it's supposed to. And some people feel it, some people don't. So you may feel it as your heart skipping a beat or fluttering. And when we do an EKG, we can see that it comes sooner than it's supposed to. And um, it can be rare or it can be often. And the more often they happen, um, the more serious it is. Great. Um, and so, you know, now that we know that some of the symptoms are of different manifestations, could you each say a little bit about um, what we what we think of with regard to diagnosis? Um, and so, Dr. Shinoy, I'll start with you. How I know you you mentioned that one of your research areas is to focus on MRI as a diagnosis process, but what other things might people um, have that be, be part of that process for diagnosis for cardiac arc? And then, um, Dr. Um, Sayed, I'll I'll ask you to talk about pulmonary and, and other manifestations that you had mentioned, eye and brain. Yeah, so again, it depends on which organ is involved. Uh, and one of the common tests that we use is a PET scan. This is because sarcoidosis is an inflammatory uh, disease process. And so we are looking for active inflammation. A PET scan helps us uh, find active inflammation in any organ. And it is used sometimes uh, also for the heart, but a heart MRI is also used to make the diagnosis of heart involvement. And other organs, um, again, it depends on which organs and what the symptoms are. And often uh, a PET scan is used, but there are other tests that can also be done. Can you just quickly say what a PET scan is for those that might not know? Yes. Yeah, so 
PET scan stands for positron emission tomography. It's one type of the many imaging scans that we use in medicine. Uh, it is a scan where uh, we inject uh, a radioisotope and it goes to the areas which are inflamed and we can image that aspect of the body and identify where the inflammation is. And it's, it's a test that is uh, commonly used for sarcoidosis anywhere in the body. Thank you. And Dr. Say, could you share a little bit about some of the other ways that people might be, uh, what other kinds of tests or diagnosis processes they might go through to get diagnosed with sarcoidosis in other organs? Sure, absolutely. Um, so typically the diagnosis of sarcoidosis largely depends on a biopsy showing something called granulomas, um, which are a collection of inflammatory cells, which is the classic finding that we see in sarcoidosis. Um, and generally, you know, granulomas can be caused by a lot of different things, um, infections mostly, but when a granuloma is happening for no reason at all, we uh, consider that to be sarcoidosis. So when you have a biopsy, the pathologist typically looks for infection, they look for cancer. When they're not seeing those things and they see this granuloma, then we say, okay, well, maybe this is sarcoidosis. Um, and generally when we see kind of what looks like a classic finding in the lungs, typically that's lymph node involvement um, in the lungs, uh, we uh, ask for a biopsy. Um, and then if that shows sarcoid and we've ruled out, or granulomas and we've ruled out everything else, we, give, uh, we can give a diagnosis of sarcoid typically. Um, and then when you have a, what we call biopsy proven sarcoidosis, and then you have kind of features um, in other organs that look like they would fit sarcoid, you don't always need a biopsy of every organ um, then to say, okay, well now you have sarcoid in your brain or you have sarcoid in your eye or sarcoid elsewhere. Typically, if you've got sarcoid that's biopsy proven in one organ and you have features of your other organs that fit, you can typically say, well, that's probably sarcoid as well. Um, does that make sense? Perfect, yeah, thank you very much. Um, you know, one of the things that I've seen a couple of different questions from uh, the group that had sent in were questions around whether you should be treated at all um, for sarcoidosis, and and is that a, a good you know prudent pathway that doctors are choosing if they're not they're withholding treatment? And then I'll kind of piggyback on that to to bring in the second question, which is around remission. Um, and does that mean that you have cured the sarcoidosis, or does it mean that it may come back at a, a later date? So, Dr. Sayed, I'll start with you on this one. Yeah, so that's a really great. Great question. Um, so sarcoidosis treatment really depends on two things. One is the organ that's involved, and two is if you're having symptoms from the organ that's involved. So the organs that we always treat, no matter what, is again, lung, eyes, and um, heart. Okay, uh, sorry, brain, eyes, and heart. Um, so those always get treated. So even if you're not having a lot of symptoms, those are such vital organs that we don't want to leave any risk of damage to those organs. So we'll treat it even if you're not having a lot of symptoms. Um, but all of the other organ involvement I think there's still a lot of research to be done. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, um, what we're learning about sarcoid is changing all the time, but right now we really treat the other organs when you're symptomatic. Um, and so that really uh, kind of uh, depends on um, how symptomatic you are and kind of what treatment you get. Um, I forgot your second. I'll let Dr. I'll let Dr. Shinoy answer the second question, yeah, which is around remission. Um, so we've had a lot of questions around if if I go into remission or I am in remission, does that mean I'm cured, um, or does it mean that I need to continue to have conversations with my doctors to make sure that it doesn't come back? Yeah, so I don't think anyone believes that sarcoidosis can be cured, although there are people where the sarcoidosis never comes back. And so they can have an extended remission, uh, which in other words is like a cure, but it's hard to know. Uh, it can only be uh, determined, you know, looking back retrospectively. 
And so I would never use the word cure uh, and people will continue to be followed uh, uh, even if they have a full remission. And we know relapses are very common uh, and in people who cut down or are able to stop their immunosuppression, there is a high risk of relapse. And so people certainly need to follow up with their physicians and need to be monitored continuously. And that kind of leads me to the next question that, um, that has come up with regard to organ damage. Uh, so a number of people asked whether their heart could recover, and Dr. Chanel, I'll have you answer that first, whether their heart could recover or get stronger um, if they are in a remission or they are under a treatment plan that's working for them. And similarly, um, Dr. Sayed, with the lungs or other organs, is the damage that's done permanent or is there a way for them to improve uh, potentially under therapy? So um, Dr if you could answer first. Yeah, so um, there are some organs which can regenerate and some organs where um, absolutely you cannot regenerate. And so the heart and the brain are organs where once you have heart damage, there is no regeneration and the damage is permanent and it remains as scar tissue. And so uh, whatever damage has occurred uh, is never going to be uh, you know, reversed, it's not reversible. And our goal is to limit future damage. That's what we are trying to do with treatments. And that is true of the heart, of the brain, and a few other organs. And Dr. Say, did you want to add in anything um, on that? Um, I think, you know, agree, agreed with Dr. Shinoy and, um, you know, typically when you see lung um, damage, so lung fibrosis, typically that's irreversible. Um, so once the damage is done, it's done there. Um, but a lot of other um, areas, you know, once you get on treatment and get some improvement of your symptoms and hopefully you're not getting further damage. But some, some organs, unfortunately you do, once there's scar tissue, it's really hard to get scar tissue back. Thank you. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about the medications. I know we started with that discussion, but some questions, some people have some questions about steroids. Are there alternatives to steroids? What's the process for determining what the right treatment is uh, for an individual and how do you even know if it's working? Um, and so uh, Dr. Said, if you wanna start us off on this one, that would be great. Absolutely. So steroids are certainly the first line for sarcoidosis. It's um, a very, potent anti-inflammatory. It helps get inflammation down quickly. Um, and we know it works really, really well. But I'm sure for those of you who have been on steroids know you get a lot of side effects. Um, and I think most of us who are sarcoid specialists now are very quick to start patients on what we call steroids bearing agents, those so second line agents for sarcoid. As I was mentioning at the beginning of our um, talk today, um, that there's not a lot of great data in sarcoid. So as you know, there's no FDA approved drug for sarcoid other than steroids. Um, and so what we, what we use is kind of the, the small studies that have been done in sarcoid. So we do know there are medications that work. Um, and a lot of those are immunosuppressant medications, methotrexate, azathioprine, Silcept, and of course, infliximab or Remicade or, um, or Humira. So these are a handful of drugs that we use. Um, and how do you know they're working? Um, a lot of times it's based on your symptoms, how you're feeling. Um, if you're feeling better, um, as Dr. Shinoi said, we use PET scans quite a bit to help determine if there's ongoing inflammation, especially heart, lungs, um, or other areas. We use MRIs for neurosarcoid. So there's different modalities that we can use to help determine sarcoid activity. Thank you, Dr. Syed. And Dr. Shinoy, obviously with cardiac, um, some of the treatment options are a little bit different um, with regard to some of the devices and other things that can be assistive to individuals. Could you say a little bit about that? Yeah, so the medications are, the immunosuppressive medications are very similar. And so there are no, nothing specific or special for the heart. So we still use prednisone and then the second line therapies as Dr. Syed mentioned. Uh, they are the same ones that are used for the heart. In addition, uh, patients who have cardiac sarcoidosis or cardiac involvement uh, uh, with sarcoidosis are at risk for um, dying suddenly from abnormal uh, heart rhythms, so ventricular arrhythmias. And so we um, 
um, we decide in every patient who has uh, cardiac involvement, whether they would benefit from a device called uh, implantable cardioverter defibrillator or ICD, which is, which is something like a pacemaker, but it can deliver a shock if ever um, the heart goes into an abnormal rhythm and can save um, the person from dying from uh, the abnormal heart rhythm. And we know cardiac sarcoidosis is a disease which has a high um, rate of ventricular arrhythmias. And so many patients often require or would benefit from an ICD. So that's the second aspect of treating uh, sarcoidosis when it involves the heart. And, you know, one of the other questions we got um, uh, from a number of different folks was around uh, transplant and how you know that that might be the right path for you uh, with, with a, your lungs or with your heart or even other organs that might be involved. What is the path for knowing that transplant might be the step that you would need to take in order to move uh, forward with your, with your treatment process? Um, and so Dr. Shun, I'll ask you to speak first and then Dr. Sayed. Yeah, so transplant is it's uh, a last resort treatment used in advanced advanced organ involvement, and so uh, with the heart, it's it's in patients who have really bad heart function or um, a high rate of ventricular arrhythmias, and this is despite all the medications and treatments that we can offer. And only in those small uh, proportion of patients, fortunately, uh, uh, we have to think about a heart transplant. And it's the same for lung transplant also um, in people who have really poor lung function due to extensive scarring and extensive uh, involvement and damage of the lungs uh, from uh, sarcoidosis. That's when we think about a transplant. And the other thing with transplants is that um, the patients have to be relatively healthy for the other organs so that they can undergo the transplant uh, and, and do well after they get the organ transplanted. So it's a challenge when um, patients have multiple organs involved or um, they have other diseases uh, that limit their health. Dr. Say, did you want to add anything in there? I don't think so. That was very thorough. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and so one of the questions that has come up is around understanding ILD, interstitial lung disease, and what that means and how you know if you have it. And is it the same thing as having COPD or is it a different process? Could you say a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, so interstitial lung disease um, is when the actual lung tissue um, is involved. So, you know, when we talk about pulmonary sarcoid, we um, are talking about, you know, the lung is split into different parts, of course, and um, one, of course, we talk about the lymph nodes inside your lungs. We Then there's, of course, your breathing tube or the trachea, and then it branches out. And then there's actually the lung tissue. Um, and when we talk about interstitial lung disease, we're talking about your lung tissue for the, for the most part um, to kind of make it, it talk about it in simpler terms. Um, and sarcoidosis can affect your, your lung tissue. Um, and the way that we typically diagnose that is chest x-ray sometimes um, if it can show up there, um, but most often we'll, we'll get a CAT scan or a CT scan, um, just gives us a better picture. It just tells us the extent of your sarcoid involvement um, typically um, for that. And it's that is um, certainly different from COPD. COPD um, is uh, probably, uh, I, typically happens more in patients who are smokers um, and that's more what we call an obstructive disease. Um, whereas uh, if you look at your pulmonary function testing, um, uh, interstitial lung disease tends to be what is called more of a restrictive disease. So it just doesn't allow your um, lungs to expand the way that they need to. This, this leads me to um, uh, some of the, the, the questions that have come, come up around symptoms um, and specifically around fatigue. There's a lot of questions uh, that came in in the last um, set of questions around um, how do you manage fatigue? 
Um, is, is fatigue something that can be treated? Um, and what, what kinds of processes are there for, for making sure that fatigue doesn't become like an all-consuming uh, process for the patient? And so Dr. Shinoy, I'll have you speak to that first, if you don't mind. Yeah, so fatigue is uh, one of the most troublesome symptoms in patients with sarcoidosis and um, up to 80% of patients can have fatigue. And the cause of the fatigue, uh, it's not straightforward. Uh, it's, it's what we call multifactorial, multiple things contribute to the fatigue. So the first thing is the extensive inflammation related to the sarcoidosis. So sarcoidosis is an inflammatory disease and the inflammation in the body uh, can lead to fatigue, um, similar to when you have an infection. Um, so think of when you have a flu or COVID, uh, there is extensive inflammation and you have fatigue. So this is very similar to that. But in addition to uh, the inflammation, another big contributor is the prednisone itself. Uh, the treatment prednisone can lead to myopathy and that can also contribute to uh, the fatigue. And then prednisone can lead to weight gain uh, and uh, mental um, uh, issues with depression and anxiety. And, and so overall, all of these contribute uh, to patients experiencing fatigue. And this is very challenging to treat. Um, um, and as I just mentioned, treating the sarcoidosis, the immunosuppression itself may contribute to the fatigue. So it's, it's very hard to treat. Some of the therapies that are recommended um, is one is uh, pulmonary rehabilitation. So exercise uh, in particularly in patients who have pulmonary sarcoidosis. So that has been shown in some small studies to help with the fatigue. And some small studies have shown uh, benefit from stimulants, so neurostimulants, and uh, the, uh, the most common one is Ritalin, um, uh, which is uh, methylphenidate uh, is the generic um, term. Um, that has been shown to help uh, with the fatigue uh, in patients with sarcoidosis. But these are small studies. Um, these have been tried, um, but there's no easy answer. And, and, you know, it's a big, big problem. Before I jump to you, Dr. Syed, um, could you just clarify what myopathies are for those that are? Um, yeah, uh, so mm -hmm. myopathy is simply muscle involvement, uh, which contributes to the fatigue. And so steroids uh, work very well in terms of reducing the inflammation. Uh, but as Dr. Syed mentioned, they have a big number of side effects. And one of the side effects is affecting the muscles. They also affect the bones, um, many organs. They cause hypertension, diabetes. Uh, um, you know, there's, there's a long list of possible bad things that prednisone can do. Uh, but the myopathy is simply muscle weakness, which, which makes people feel fatigue. Thank you for that clarification. And Dr. Said, do you have any strategies for people? I know um, Dr. Shinoy mentioned exercise, but do you have any other strategies that you typically recommend for people as they're trying to navigate fatigue? Yeah, I think, you know, certainly um, looking for any other underlying causes of fatigue. So, you know, Dr. Shinoy absolutely mentioned all the right things um, that we look for, sarcoid itself, active inflammation, um, medications that we use, but then, you know, making sure your thyroid's been checked, making sure there's no sleep issues. So a lot of patients may have undiagnosed sleep apnea that can contribute. So making sure you are looking for causes outside of sarcoid. I think a lot of patients too who have sarcoid and then their doctors um, tend to tend to narrow in on sarcoid and only think sarcoid. But remember, there are other things too that we should always consider. So don't don't forget to make sure we're ruling out other causes. Um, so that that would be my my two cents on that. No, that's really helpful. And um, Dr. Shinoy, you had mentioned uh, that the prednisone can cause the muscle pain, but also bone um, issues and other pieces like that. And we got a lot of questions around. Um, joint pain, muscle pain, um, and also uh, bone uh, and arthritis. 
Um, are, is that typically affiliated with sarcoidosis or is it only a result of, uh, of, of something like a prednisone? Could you say a little bit more on that? Yes, so both sarcoidosis and prednisone can cause uh, this. Uh, it's very difficult to tease out which is contributing how much. Sometimes it's both. Uh, and sometimes it's obvious things like osteoporosis, osteonecrosis. We tend to blame the prednisone for it. Um, and then, you know, myopathies, it's hard to know, is it uh, because of the sarcoidosis or is it because of prednisone or perhaps both? Um, so yeah, uh, it could be both, but sometimes it's hard to tease out what is the biggest contributor. Thank you. And um, Dr. Syed, uh, we, we've gotten a couple of different questions for people around uh, other kinds of symptoms that are maybe endocrine related, like um, uh, excessive sweating or sweating in particular areas of the body, um, uh, round moon faces and, and other kinds of uh, symptoms that could be associated with uh, endocrine kind of pieces. Could you say a little bit about that for folks? Sure. Um, so night sweats certainly are very com is very common, especially in patients with active sarcoid. Um, so it can happen. Um, sweating in particular areas, I'm not sure that I've heard of unless Dr. Shinoy has. Um, so I'm not sure that I've uh, particularly seen that in particular. But moon feces we do see often as a side effect of steroids itself. Um, that is very common, especially if you've been on steroids um, for a very long time. Um, we call that Cushing syndrome, um, and it does happen as a side effect of um, chronic steroid use, and hopefully will get better when you come off of steroids. Um, sometimes doesn't, but typically should resolve as you come off of steroids. And Dr. Shrey, did you want to add anything in there? No, I think Dr. Syed covered it all. So the other questions that we're getting is uh, around um, uh, frustration, anger, depression, um, and how that's affiliated with sarcoidosis itself or with medications that people are taking. Um, so uh, Dr. Uh, Syed, maybe you can start us off and then we'll go down to Dr. Dr. Sure. Shimmer. Well, I think, um, you know, uh, so chronic illness, uh, first off, um, is a very hard thing to deal with, especially something like sarcoidosis that can affect multiple organs and can make you feel very tired. So I think feeling frustrated or depressed is is um, is very understandable. Um, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of patients probably do feel that way. Um, and uh, so, you know, thankfully there are support groups out there for patients who are feeling that way, or and even for patients who aren't feeling that way. You know, I think having um, a good support system is incredibly important, um, but also know that some of your medications do make you feel that way. Um, you know, uh, prednisone and Celsept are probably the most commonly known to cause those types of side effects, prednisone especially, um, you know, uh, roid rage uh, is a known term for steroids causing mood swings um, and can even cause the opposite. It can cause depression. Um, it can cause insomnia. It can cause anxiety. It can cause a lot of different symptoms. Um, so, you know, certainly if you feel very different after starting a new medication, do talk to your doctor about it. You know, every patient is different. Every patient responds to medications differently. You know your body the best. And so I think if you feel like a medicine is causing symptoms for you, you should bring it up. And, and Dr. Shinoy, um, you know, one of the questions was, is that a symptom for cardiac sarcoidosis if people are starting to have uh, depression or, or anxiety, especially anxiety was noted, um, is that something that they should be, you know, highlighting for their doctor? Simply anxiety uh, without any obvious rhythm problem or anything that is specific for the heart uh, may not be a sign of um, cardiac involvement. But yes, anxiety, as Dr. Syed said, it's it's very common. It's understandable. Uh, it's 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 a it's a bad disease, and the treatments are also not uh, particularly uh, safe, and they have side effects as well. So we often see anxiety and depression. The key thing is to recognize it and, and get treatment and they can be treated. Uh, and so we talk about 
immunosuppression a lot in sarcoidosis, but there are also non-immunosuppression treatments that may help. And one of the things I mentioned is the stimulants in people who have fatigue, so that, that may help. Similarly, antidepressants in people who have uh, depression can help. And in some people who have chronic pain, uh, analgesics uh, can also help. So these are the things that also um, can help uh, manage the disease. And Dr. Shinoy, uh, we, we see a lot of people asking questions about stress and whether it causes sarcoidosis or is one of the presumed causes to sarcoidosis and whether it can make your sarcoidosis worse. Would you say a little bit on that? So I think stress makes everything worse uh, in terms of in medicine. And it's difficult to, again, tease out the exact contribution of uh, stress. I, I remember reading uh, one study where uh, patients with pulmonary sarcoidosis, uh, the stressed people had worse lung function. Uh, and so I'm sure stress contributes overall to how patients feel uh, and they may um, uh, experience more symptoms from the same sarcoidosis that they have compared to patients who are not stressed. So it's definitely uh, not a good thing. And, um, you know, we should do the best to try and uh, handle that, whether it is through exercise, rehab, mindfulness um, uh, therapy, sometimes cognitive behavioral therapy, whatever works manage the stress is definitely uh, helpful. But to answer the question, we don't have a direct um, um, evidence of direct involvement in sarcoidosis causing sarcoidosis, but certainly it makes things worse. Uh, thank you for uh, clarifying. And um, one of the questions that we're seeing, and I've seen a couple of questions around um, whether genetic testing is relevant for sarcoidosis um, and whether blood tests are a way to be able to tell if someone is doing better or worse. Um, so Dr. Say, could you say a little bit about the roles of those different kinds of testing? Yeah, so um, currently we don't do genetic testing for sarcoidosis, mostly because um, there's not a great correlation, meaning there are a lot of patients who may have the gene for sarcoidosis or test positive for genetic testing and never develop sarcoidosis. And then there, vice versa is true. There may be patients with sarcoidosis who may not have the, HL, the genes that we are aware of that cause sarcoidosis. So currently we don't do it and we don't recommend screening also of family members with sarcoidosis because it, you know, because if there are no active symptoms, then we may not necessarily treat for that. Um, so currently we don't do any of those things. Um, in terms of labs, there's actually no great what we call biomarkers, which means blood tests that diagnose or help us um, assess for sarcoid activity. Um, there are, you know, inflammatory markers like sed rates and CRPs um, that we will use for some patients, um, but they're not great because a lot of different things can increase your sed rate and CRP. Um, infections, um, cancers, you know, and sed rates and CRPs vary um, day by day, week by week for different patients. So they're not perfect markers, um, certainly. Um, they also increase with age, um, increase with your weight, you know, different things can affect those numbers. So um, there's no perfect test, unfortunately. Um, you know, currently a lot of it is um, what we know about sarcoid, how you present, what your imaging, what your symptoms and uh, look like, and of course, a biopsy showing sarcoid. Dr. Shinoy, do you could you say a little bit on um, a nerve pain? A lot of people are mentioning that they feel like they get a lot of nerve pain um, as associated uh, with their disease, and, and whether that's something that's pointing to something else, or whether that could be associated with sarcoidosis or sarcoidosis treatments. So sarcoidosis is uh, known to cause something called small fiber neuropathy, uh, which can lead to some of the symptoms, the neurologic symptoms, and also it can contribute to fatigue. And so it's a known problem. Um, it does not happen very often. Uh, it's probably under 10% of all sarcoidosis patients, but it certainly can uh, cause that. 
And then again, some of the treatments itself can lead to uh, neurologic side effects, and it may be directly or it may be indirectly. So for instance, prednisone can lead to diabetes and diabetes or worsening, and that can have diabetic neuropathy. And so um, there may be many reasons why patients with sarcoidosis experience neurologic symptoms and issues. Dr. Said, did you want to add in anything on that? Um, no, I don't think so. I think that's, you know, the small fiber neuropathy is the main thing. And of course, you know, looking for other idea, other causes like diabetes. Um, and uh, of course, if it's, um, if it's new or different, you certainly want to bring it up with your sarcoid doctor because you want to make sure there's no neurosarcoidosis, of course, sarcoid of the brain, but that's, um, you know, typically you'll have some other symptoms with that. Um, but small fiber neuropathy does occur with sarcoid patients. Um, I got a question as well about um, lymphedema and how that ties in with sarcoidosis. Dr. Say, could you say a little bit about that? Yeah. And what lymphedema is for those yeah. that might not know. <laughs> Absolutely. So lymphedema is, um, you know, pretty significant swelling of an extremity, typically one, uh, one extremity or even two extremities. You can see it in an arm or a leg. Um, and it usually happens if there is obstruction of, um, you know, uh, of what we call lymphatic return. Um, can happen from really swollen lymph nodes. Um, so that would be really unusual to see in sarcoidosis, but really theoretically could happen um, if you have a very swollen lymph node from sarcoid. Can't say that I've seen it um, in any of my sarcoid patients. Have you, Dr. Shinoi? Have you ever seen it? I haven't, uh, but I have to say lymph node involvement is very, very common uh, yeah, in sarcoidosis. Right. Yes. Um, for lymphedema to happen, as Dr. Syed said, there has to be obstruction. So the swelling has to be really bad. And for lower extremity or leg swelling uh, or lymphedema in the legs, the swelling has to be in the lymph nodes in the groin or in the lower abdomen. And if they are swollen enough and the lymphatic flow is obstructed or blocked, then you could have lymphedema. Again, I haven't personally seen it, but uh, there are certainly um, case reports and case series about it. Uh, and Dr. Shoy, can you say a little bit about how you think diet plays a role in, in symptom management uh, as well as uh, progression of the disease or other things that people should be concerned about? Well, um, I don't think there is a direct um, relationship between uh, diet and sarcoidosis um, activity in terms of inflammation. Uh, obviously, um, you know, healthy diet helps, uh, especially with weight control, uh, which can make everything worse, uh, being overweight. And also prednisone can lead to uh, weight gain. And so one of the ways to treat that and to deal with that would be uh, managing and um, using a good diet. But there is no direct association or link between uh, uh, a specific kind of diet uh, and how uh, the sarcoidosis is. And um, so I wanna kind of pivot for a second and talk a little bit about what's happening in research. And both of you are doing research in the space, involved in research in the space. Um, and so could each of you share a little bit about some of the things that you're seeing and hearing and things that might be exciting on the horizon um, in research? And Dr. Sayed, I'll have you start off. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there are certainly our clinical trials for um, new medications. Um, in sarcoidosis. Um, I, I know, for, at least at our center, we are um, looking at um, uh, anakinra, which is an anti-IL-1. Um, so it's an interleukin-1 um, in cardiac sarcoidosis, which is exciting uh, with Dr. Crone, who's our cardiologist here. Um, and then we, um, there's also, of course, studies not at our institution, um, but kind of across the U.S. looking at JAK inhibitors, um, Zelgans or tofacitinib, um, that is uh, being looked at more and more in sarcoid. Um, so I think there will hopefully be new medications on the horizon um, for sarcoid, which we certainly do need, um, which I'm excited to hear more about. 
And Dr. Shinoy, do you have some uh, exciting trials that you've been hearing about or exciting research that's being done to understand the disease better? Well, so uh, uh, there are two aspects to this question. So I think uh, one is what Dr. Syed covered. I think there is a lot of interest and there is more research in sarcoidosis, more understanding of organ involvement um, and, and uh, some more uh, trials. And the other aspect is there's still a lot that needs to be done. Uh, and um, I think uh, it's encouraging to see foundations such as FSR. And this week I learned about the European uh, Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. Um, and uh, more and more people are getting funded by the NIH and other foundations. So I think uh, there has been progress and uh, there needs to be more progress uh, in this area in terms of research, uh, but I'm excited by uh, what's happening right now. Thank you. And I'll just chime in to say that uh, FSR does have a page um, that lists off clinical trials. So if you're interested in learning more, getting involved in clinical trials, we do encourage you to, um, to come on and, and learn about those trials, see if you're fit for any of those trials. Um, and there's, you know, more potential opportunities on the horizon. There's also trials at academic centers, as Dr. Say was mentioning, that you can oftentimes be a part of. And so this is a good opportunity to uh, be involved in that. And then we also have a registry, which is an opportunity to help people better understand all these symptoms that people are talking about. So please do consider being involved um, in those different pieces as well uh, as we look to the future. And I guess what, as we're starting to kind of wind down a little bit, um, one of the other questions that comes out is, is this feels sometimes a little hopeless for some people. They feel a little bit concerned and hopeless about the disease. As researchers, as clinicians, what gives you hope in this space? And I will start with you, Dr. Shinoy. Well, um, so, as I mentioned, I think um, this is a disease that's been around for uh, probably 100 years, 150 years, and the first prednisone treatment was in 1951. So we've been we've been um, um, dealing with sarcoidosis for a long time, but only in the last uh, 10 or 20 years we have made a lot of discoveries. I would say, yeah, 10, 15 years. We have learned a lot about uh, uh, different therapies, what helps, what works, uh, different organ involvement. Um, I work in cardiac sarcoidosis and there has been a lot of progress in diagnosing cardiac sarcoidosis, um, in um, deciding the outcome prognosis, uh, how patients will do after cardiac sarcoidosis. So there has been a lot of progress only in the last uh, decade. So I'm hopeful that uh, there will be a lot more progress uh, and we will get to managing sarcoidosis like a chronic disease uh, with very little um, suffering and very little uh, deaths related directly to sarcoidosis. And Dr. Sayed? Yeah, I agree with a lot of what Dr. Shinoy is saying. You know, from the time I started my training, a lot of us had no idea what to do when a sarcoidosis patient came into our clinic. And now you see um, a lot of us being very comfortable when a sarcoid patient comes in. You see all these sarcoid uh, specialty clinics are popping up kind of um, in a lot of places around the country. So you see this interest um, from physicians and um, different healthcare workers in treating sarcoid patients, which is really, really great. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of this development and research certainly makes me feel hopeful, but also knowing, um, you know, having done our sarcoid clinic for so long now, seeing our patients get better, you know, we know these treatments are working and they're helping. Um, and whereas these patients who, um, you know, have had sarcoid for 30 years and really didn't feel well, and suddenly you get them on good treatment and their lives are turning around to me, it's, it's a great feeling to be able to do that. Um, so that makes me feel really hopeful. 
Well, thank you both for those uh, for those comments. And then the last thing I'm going to ask you before we we uh, kind of start to close out here is um, what one thing do you want people to take away from this today? If you had one um, uh, comment or one reflection from the different questions that were being asked that you want people to make sure they take away, what would that be? And Dr. Um, Sayed, I'll start with you. Um, well, I'd say, you know, this is a tough disease that you all are dealing with, no doubt about it, but there is definitely a lot of people out here who are here to help the FSR being a really great resource, please do use them as much as possible I and mean, they've been a great resource for us as a clinic. Um, and they're very incredibly supportive um, and please, you know, feel free to reach out to um, the local sarcoid clinic close to you um, or anywhere, uh, you know, that you'd like to be seen. We're always happy to see patients um, at our location as well. Uh, great. And Dr. Shinoy? Yeah, I, I have very similar uh, uh, thoughts. I, I would say that this seems like it's, it's a bad disease, but it's certainly manageable. Uh, with the right expertise. So I, I encourage uh, all patients to seek uh, um, people with expertise. Not everyone really knows about this, mainly because it's a rare disease uh, and not every physician is um, trained to um, treat and handle sarcoidosis. But in the right hands, at the right team, uh, this is definitely something that can be managed, uh, and uh, in most people, um, you can have a uh, very good quality of life. I would like to thank both Dr. Shinoy and Dr. Syed for their expertise today, for sharing their information, and, and for providing that hope that we know this is out there. This is a hopeful time in sarcoidosis. As, as you heard, there's a lot more involvement. There's a lot more interest. Um, and it is a really hopeful time. And, and there are potentially new treatments and new therapies on the horizon as we continue to work through all of this. I would also like to thank our sponsors, um, Atire, Pharma, Malincrot, and Zentria, who are supporting us, um, as well as um, continuing to drive forward the effort to support all of the needs of the patients. I encourage you again to go onto our our website to learn more about these partners, um, the clinical trials they have, and the other information that they have as well. We also ask you to please uh, consider uh, filling out our survey. We can only get better by uh, hearing from you, and we want to make these sessions as meaningful and as important to you as possible. So please do complete the survey. We will be following up um, today with information for you uh, that came out of today's session, some links that you saw that were being jumped dumped into the chat for you to look at and, and know where to go and get additional information. And then we encourage you, if you found this to be a very helpful session, please consider a donation to FSR so that you can make it possible for us to continue programs like this. It is our goal to be, provide you the most um, helpful information possible. And with the support of our wonderful FSR Global Sarcoidosis Clinic Alliance members and their expertise, we are able to do that with you tonight. So thank you all for joining us and have a really wonderful evening. Thank you. Hi, thanks so much. Thank you.